Hello, Professor for Geomorphology in the Institute of Earth Surface Dynamics at the University of Lausanne since 2011. Before moving to Lausanne, he was professor for over 10 years, I think, in the UK, physical geography, first in Leeds and then in Durham. Stuart got his PhD from the University of Cambridge and the Sydney University of London in 1994. So this means that he has been working uh, actively uh, since over 25 years in the area of sediment dynamics, fluvial geomorphology and flood modeling. He has been highly successful in his career, he's well published, and he has made fundamental contributions to the field and this is also well reflected in the awards that he's received. Checking his website, I counted 11. Just to mention two, he received the Victoria Medal from the UK Royal Geographic Society in 2012 and the Ralph A. Banuel Medal from the European Geoscience Union in recognition of research achievements in geomorphology in 2011. With this, I'd like to welcome Stuart again and the floor is yours. Okay, um, it's a great pleasure to come and talk to you uh, today about a subject that is uh, very uh, close to my heart. Uh, I, it's, a, it's a story that's well known. Uh, when I was a student, I wanted to go and study the social sciences, but we had an opportunity to do a field class uh, in the summer after our first year. And I wanted to go to Mexico City to study uh, urban pollution. Uh, but and I signed the list, but I signed the list to go to the Arola Glacier in Switzerland. Uh, and it's this great error that I made uh, in January 1989 that explains why I'm here uh, today um, to talk to you uh, about uh, a subject that, that I think is really interesting. And although I'm going to talk to you really about it, quite a detailed case study today uh, relating primarily to an FNS Synergy project called Sedfate. Um, I'm actually going to talk, use that to draw out some wider thinking about the nature of the Anthropocene and the way in which we might see the Anthropocene uh, in something like sediments uh, of Lake Geneva. My group, just to, to let you know what I do, um, what interests me as, 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 a, as, a, as a kind of geomorphologist is not simply geomorphology. It's trying to situate, particularly in high mountain alpine environments, what goes on in terms of climate, glaciers and snow, how that controls the way in which sediment moves through these kinds of systems, and then what the consequences are of that, particularly in my case now for uh, ecosystems. I'm not going to talk much about ecosystems at all today, we're going to stay a little bit uh, focused on the uh, water uh, and the uh, sediment. My context for the talk is actually quite nicely given by this paper that many of you will know appeared in Science a couple of years ago, uh, which talks about the idea that perhaps we can now finally say that there is an Anthropocene um, a signal that might be detectable uh, in things like uh, lake uh, stratigraphy. Uh, and they pose this very interesting question, any formal recognition of the Anthropocene epoch must rest upon uh, uh, identify, uh, identification of the changes that humans have made to the Earth's system and which can be seen in stratigraphic signature and sediments. Now, of course, this is a tall order. Look at the history uh, of the Earth. Uh, I mean, this is already a non-linear scale, but this is, this is the last 2.4 million years. Um, look at the uh, Holocene, which is this tiny blip at the end of the last ice age. And even tinier is this very, very rapid temperature rise associated with the Anthropocene. And depending on what definition you use for the start of the Anthropocene, we're looking at something that might be as little as 200 years, uh, but something that might be a, a few thousand years if you take a definition a little bit larger, reflecting the fact that widespread land, widespread land use changes in many parts of the world actually began uh, well, during the, uh, well, well earlier than now during the uh, Holocene. I guess my interest today uh, is illustrated by the slide that, that Waters et al. Um, used to illustrate uh, their, their paper, their graphical abstract. And they said, look, this is the signature of the Holocene, a deglacial signature of the proglacial lake, where in this core you can see the transition from glacial sediment uh, to organic sediment that you would see in any system subject to glacier uh, recession with climatic amelioration in the retreat of the glacier 
with a delay of some tens uh, or even hundreds of years, you see a vegetation succession. But the problem that poses is that, as a signature of the Anthropocene, is not particularly helpful. Because we can see these repeated instances of climatic amelioration throughout uh, the Quaternary. And indeed, to be fair on them, they actually talk very little about the sediments uh, in the end uh, in their paper. And it is true that we're producing a whole series of products now that you would easily use or e could easily use to say, yes, this is the human signal uh, of our impact on the environment, reflected in fly ash, metals, radionuclides, plastics, products that can only be there uh, because of uh, human activity. But the context for today is what about sediment? Let's go back to um, the geologist's interest uh, historically uh, in these epochs, where often it's the sedimentary signal um, that is, is used uh, to uh, identify what those uh, epochs involve. And I guess that the thing we have to say here is that sediment deposition, as we said in erosion, uh, is a natural process. So if we're starting to think about sediments in the Anthropocene, the signal we need to think about is what is the change in sedimentation rate? Can we see, due to climate change, human-driven climate change, global warming, any change in the amount of sediment that has been delivered to our great depositional system, such as lakes and oceans? <laughs> and of course, um, that's complicated because the stratigraphic signature of sed sediment in the, the Anthropocene is not just related to global change. In previous epochs, when human impacts were much lower, it key was the global change signal that we see. But now we have to also think about how global change, in terms of sediments, is impacting with the effects of human activities to condition the stratigraphy um, that we produce. And that's really these two issues uh, are kind of the aim behind my talk today, to think about can we start to see changes in rates of sedimentation in our basins in response to climate change? Can we see the Anthropocene in the making? And in particular, after that, I think a little bit about how this might relate to some of the uh, other local human impacts in the system. Now, uh, and this is a bit provocative, I have to say, particularly in this audience, um, sediment is not easy. These are what I call the easy sciences. <laughs> now, <laughs> I suspect you want me to leave fairly rapidly. Why, why are these the easy sciences and why is sediment not difficult? Of course, these are difficult sciences. It's just one fundamental point. We don't measure sediment. Okay? So think about homogenized temperature data series in, in, in Switzerland, the gridded precipitation products or something like uh, um, uh, Meteor Suisse from 1961. The wonderful data sets we have from Glamos, the Veve uh, Esnat uh, data record on glacier recession that goes back into the 19th century. Again, the magnificent data we have in Switzerland from the Offev and from the cantons on the hydrology of river flows. That's why they're the easier sciences. If you're trying to think about how rates are changing, you can at least get some data. It's not like that in relation to sediment because we have less tradition of measuring it, and to be fair, sediment, unless you're, you're me, is probably a little bit less important, um, although we are starting to recognize the importance of sediment in things like minimum flow requirements uh, for organisms if you're trying to improve the quality of the water course, but also sediment is much harder to measure. Now, the one exception in Switzerland, I have to say, is the work done by the, the, the VSL. Um, and they've been pioneering these kinds of measurement stations. We've been able to put one in uh, to the Vallon de Nord in the east of Canton Vaux uh, in collaboration uh, with them. This is now in the Vallon de Nord, and I'll be dead when that station becomes useful because to get the kinds of long time series that you need to look at change, um, we need to wait 20, 30, 40, even uh, 50 years. Well, I hope I'll be dead. Years, but, anyway. um, but the WSL, though, um, there is already some very exciting data emerging from the Erlen Bat. I'm not actually going to talk about the Erlen Bat today. The problem with these kinds of stations is they're strongly reliant on indirect measurements. Here it's noise that they're measuring, the noise made by sediment moving. But also, um, there aren't that many of them because they're very expensive, uh, and they aren't necessarily where you need them if you're going to identify the environments that climate change 
is changing most. And for me, as I'll talk to you later, it's what's going on around glaciers that's really important. Of course, the other thing is just to go straight to the depositional record itself. Um, and here I've taken one of the, the, the papers that's coming out of our SEDFAE project, um, uh, which is sedimentation rates in Upper Lake Geneva between 1889 and 2014. What Diego Silva did was he compared the current bathymetry of the Upper Lake with that measured in the Forel maps at the end of the uh, 19th century. Here's the Rhone, which arrives into Upper Lake Geneva. You can see the current uh, sub-lacustrine canyon, uh, which is actually filling up. You can see an ancient sub-lacustrine canyon, uh, which is there, and very substantial spatial variability uh, in your depositional rates. Where are you going to take your core in order to understand how that has changed through time? Particularly given that this sub stream canyon is going to migrate around in response to uh, field and erosion cycles. And both of those are examples of why sediment is extremely difficult. Now, um, what we've been able to do in the SIDFAE project um, is to try to, encounter, to, to address some of these issues by developing a multi-scale project. So here's uh, Lake Geneva, here's the uh, Swiss Rhone uh, Basin. Um, the main principal branch of the Rhone uh, is just here. Um, we've been, with the University of Geneva, have been looking at bathymetric surveys, but also cores and assimilating data. The University of Bern has been trying to actually use advanced geochemical techniques to look at long-term erosion rates, so erosion rates that go back to the period before human, major human impacts in the basin, but also where sediment is coming from. The ETH has been looking at some of the statistical data that you can acquire by analysing long time series, such as the Port to Say record of sediment concentration, which I'll mention in a moment. Uh, and then finally, my responsibility is given the signatures that we can get out of these kinds of analyses, what are the processes going on in the upper parts of these basins in response to climate warming? Can we actually see and quantify? how alpine basins are responding to temperature rise. Now, let's jump into what we find. So I'm going to talk, first of all, a little bit about the overall conclusions for what's going on uh, down here. Now, this is the work from uh, Anna Costa's PhD at the ETH. Here is the basin average mean annual temperature, and I think you in this graph, with this big jump uh, in 1987. A less clear precipitation signal, perhaps declining a little bit in this basin in the last 20 years. But what's really quite interesting is when we looked at the Port de Say um, a record of suspended sediment concentrations, I see this very interesting poster that also uh, does this kind of analysis, uh, uh, you see a very marked jump uh, in the middle of the 1980s in the typical suspended sediment concentrations at Port de Say that matches pretty much uh, the rise uh, in temperature you don't see the same discharge signal. Now, we'll talk about why that gets see the same discharge signal if we have time a little bit later. We can go to, into it in a little bit more detail. And this is the change in the suspended sediment concentration in terms of monthly averages for the period 65 to 86, and 1987 to 2015. The gray um, is the, the variability. The red uh, is the sig that's defined by the, the first of these two periods, so it's the 95% confidence limits. The red uh, is what happens, uh, or the mean uh, for the period 87 to 2015, and what you see is this jump in suspended sediment concentration is very much a summer signal. Now, why does that matter? What it means is we need to find something that could be explaining why the loading of sediment to Lake Geneva uh, is greater in the summer. Now, I don't have time to go into the bathymetric work, but we also, in our cores from the mid-1980s, observed in Lake Geneva uh, an increase in the amount of sediment arriving uh, in the lake. And that really uh, is my job. It's to, be, to take these, these data uh, and then look upstream and see what's going on. Now, I've said that doing sediment uh, is not easy, but we are, in Switzerland, very, very fortunate. Because of our investment in hydroelectric power, we've put in these very high altitude gauging stations, which are not only important for giving us wonderful data on the hydrology of these catchments and how it's changing, but we've been developing in Lausanne a method for using them to directly <coughs> estimate sediment yield. And I'm sure all of you who've walked in the Alps will have seen these little signs, the little person here being chased by a wave in the water. 
It's because these intakes effectively uh, are designed to trap sediments so that the water can be transferred laterally to storage uh, in a dam. Whenever they're full, you have to open the gates, uh, and you have to do that either for the coarse sediment trap, because there's a, a coarse sediment trap here, or in this case, some of them also, also have fine sediment traps. You have to open the gates, and the water level recorder, which has to be there for statutory reasons, for, for federal requirements, uh, records effectively a drop. And by talking to the hydropower companies about how they decide when this is full and how these gates are, are operated, we can construct pretty precisely the volume of sediment that is released. And we can do that, in theory, right back to the 1960s. And so that's the methodology that we've been uh, trying uh, to develop. I should just say that the data we get don't talk about wash load because the wash load isn't, doesn't settle out. We're talking about the uh, suspended load that's, uh, that's suspended by turbulence uh, and also the gravel uh, bed load and core. So that's the data that we can get. We can't get the wash load, which of course is, is extremely important uh, in glaciated basins. Now straight away, um, we can start to look at what that tells us. And there are no data like this anywhere else uh, in the world. We're looking here at the records for um, six glaciers. To say a few words about them, Berthold and uh, Dublanche, very small, uh, high glaciers. Just give you some idea of the altitudes here. The, the altitude valley bottom is about 2,100 meters. The altitude of the ridge on this side of the valley is about 3,300. Here we go up a little bit higher, up to 3,500. Berthold and Dublanche, small ice cover. Those are those two there. The other four all have percentages of ice cover that is still, uh, despite glacier retreat, greater than 50%. Two of those basins, for Glacier de Rolla and Sijon Louvre, have, are lower and their glaciers are retreating very rapidly. Two others, Pies and Vuive, are higher uh, and they are retreating uh, also, but they've really only accelerated in their recession in the last few years. Now, this is the annual sediment yield through time. I've started from the late 1970s because not all of these basins we can get data for from before uh, the mid 1970s. What do you see? Well, firstly, the least glaciated basins actually produce not much sediment. And it's a reminder of this fundamental <coughs> principle that in alpine environments, glaciers are the sediment factory. They are so good at eroding their beds, they make lots of sediment. Second, look at this rise of sediment yield during the 1980s. These basins were producing an awful lot more sediment uh, during that period. There's then something we've got to explain that I'll come back to later, which is it seems to decline. We know during this period, temperature uh, didn't show that kind of pattern. If it did, it was a weaker signal. Um, but the other thing I want to show you is how these higher basins of Weeby and Pierce were really quite negligible uh, when we go back to the uh, uh, first part of this period. But with continued warming, they've switched on. The sediment factory, which was probably there all the time, has suddenly started getting rid of its sediment in these basins in the way that it wasn't in the first part of these series. But this gives us the a priori uh, evidence that what we might be seeing down here in Lake Geneva is some kind of sediment signal associated with what's going on uh, in, in glaciated environments. Now the question then becomes, what is going on? What can we say about the processes that might be behind uh, this signal? Well, to do that, I just need to give you a little bit of the kind of conceptual framework. Uh, to, for those of you who are not geomorphologists, so you understand a little bit about how we think about sediment movement in these basins. I've just got two images that will help me uh, illustrate that. Sediment movement, of course, is a function of mobilization. Um, flux and, of course, some weathering. Weathering does happen to sediment loss in transport and deposition. The prior hydrological system, of course, is directly implicated in mobilizing sediment in training material, transforming it and determining where it is developing. So we need to understand snow, ice uh, and water. Climate change can of course impact that cryohydrological system, but also through its effect on things like permafrost melt, uh, impact on the mobilization of sediments. There is a very important climate landform legacy in these systems, and I'm going to mention this later, but, but not in too much detail. And you see that nicely in the water ash. Here we have an old moraine ridge that's slowly eroding, here we have the hill slope, and what you can see is that uh, this moraine, it's fairly classical for a lateral moraine, has, has left behind it a trough behind 
which means that even if you've got more mass movement going on on this hill slope, the sediment which is there can't get down and out into the basin. I'll talk about connectivity in a little while. And again illustrated here the importance of organic and organic mineral buffering. Another process important that I'm, that's important I'm not going to have time to, 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 to talk about. When you're talking about deposition in any kind of system, or erosion in any kind of system, that changes the shape of the system, and that change in the shape changes the partition of energy. The formation of a braided plane here changes the efficiency with which water can move sediment from here downstream. And again, we have to take that into account. Now, it's that system that I'm interested in posing the question, how is human impacts through uh, fossil fuel driven climate change changing the way this system operates. Now, because of time, I'm going to get rid of a few bits. And I'm going to really focus on how we can see links between climate change, the cryohydrological system, and sediment movement. And the first thing we need to do is to go right up into the top of the basin. Here's the whole glacier uh, Darola. Um, to give you some idea what this glacier is doing, um, when I first went there uh, in uh, uh, 1989, the snap was here. We've had a huge recession, 1.6 kilometers of recession since. This feature here was made in the 1850s. This is what we call the Little Ice Age uh, Moraine. It just gives you some idea of the scale of glacier recession in this environment. Uh, initially at a slow rate post Little Ice Age, more rapidly in the last 40 years. Of course, what we've got up here is some hill slopes, and these are full of sediment. I mean, I hope all of you can see that there's lots of sediment in this system. This is not a system that's limited by the ability of the landscape to make sediment. The sediment's already been made. And of course, you might think there's increased sediment supply in these kinds of systems to the valley bottoms due to things like permafrost melt and, and, and other processes like glacial uh, debuttressing. And what we tried to do was say, could we see this? Can we see the sediment factory becoming more active in terms of transporting the system? To do that, just to, just to give you, remind you of this uh, Meteo Suisse uh, uh, graph, which shows this period of climate stability transitioning into climate warming, climate stability from the 50s to the 80s, climate warming from the 80s. <coughs> and what we've done is developed a method using archival imagery held by Swiss Topo to, to calculate historical elevation models, historical topographic data, that we can then use to work out how the landscape is changing. And the results are very interesting. Here we have the Arola Valley at 2,000 metres, we have a ridge of about 3,300 metres, and you can see that the period uh, 1967 to 2012, the surface loss, and in blue, the surface gain. Now, most of the big changes relate to what's going on in the cryosphere, these blue dots uh, in here. So this is a hanging glacier. It's uh, losing mass here. The melt that it's producing is causing this part of the glacier to flow more rapidly. Because it's still frozen at its margin as is normal, and you get thickening of the middle part of the glacier, and that's the signal you see here and here. But there are other parts of the landscape where we can still see um, quite clearly um, erosion and deposition. And this graph illustrates that for these two periods, the climatically stable period and the warming period, it's a star spider diagram, so this is the rate of erosion uh, in meters per kilometer squared uh, per year, uh, and the red dots are the changes that you get when it's warming, the blue dots close to the center are when it's cooling. Of course, you have to look at both surface gain and surface loss, because sedimentary systems don't just evacuate eroded <coughs> sediment, they deposit it further downstream, but the key point is, these red plots for all of these types of landscapes, of landforms, plot outside the blue dots. Put simply, we can see the system is becoming more active. We see the same also for acceleration of rock glaciers, something I don't have time uh, to talk about. But there we get a problem. Because the other thing you see in this kind of landscape is high levels of disconnection. So the changes are going on up here. But this is a, a, what's called a connectivity index. It measures the ease with which material is likely to be moved from upstream to downstream. Blue is poorly connected. Red is well connected. At the bottom here, you've got three uh, alluvial fans. One which is clearly still active, which is this one up here, where you can see high levels of connectivity. Two that are inactive, and despite there being big changes going on up here, um, you see uh, high levels of disconnection. 
The only reason this one has high connectivity is because whilst it's well connected, it's also due to vegetation growth relatively stable. So the key point here uh, is that connection uh, matters. Now, of course, and I don't really have time to go about this, um, even though this is, this is what's called a connectivity index, it's something that um, uh, is a static index. In the most extreme events, some of these disconnected areas can become connected, and of course that's really what happened in the classic example of, of Bondo. And it is possible that that can, kind of event can produce short-term increases uh, in sediment uh, loading. But to have that explain a systematic multi-year increase in sediment loading to something like Lake Geneva, you also need to have that kind of event happening every year. Unfortunately, we don't seem to be getting a bondo every year. The other thing that's quite interesting, though, um, is, okay, we can't say, our conclusions are pretty much that, yes, these hill slopes are becoming more active, but in terms of sediment flux, we have no evidence, due to high disconnection, that they are actually moving more sediment downstream. The answer appears to be what's actually going on uh, in relation to glaciers. Now, glaciers themselves are extremely inefficient at moving sediments, and that's because typical glacier surface velocities of the, are of the orders of meters uh, per year, and those are slowing down as glaciers thin. So there may be lots of sediment on the surface of this glacier, but it's moving forward very, very slowly. What does the work is the subglacial rivers, because the sediment transport uh, uh, capacity of glacier melt is very high, and here you see, plotted on the same graph, the basin water yield in cubic kilometers per year for the whole glacier Dairola, that's the crosses, coupled against the volumetric transport capacity, modeled the amount of sediment you can transport. And as these glaciers are subsidizing glacier melt because they're melting, of course it's a process that might stop if we get past something called uh, peak water. You can also see uh, a rise in the volumetric tr uh, transport capacity. And so that's really our argument. What's going on in this system, uh, what's driving the record we're seeing downstream, is the efficiency with which glaciers can now evacuate sediment. I don't have time to go through this, but the other thing we also have to look at is the effects of changes in the shape of glacier hydrographs, which are really important when you put them through nonlinear sediment transport laws, because n is greater than 1, so if you change the peakiness of a hydrograph, you, you, you change very dramatically the amount of sediment you can uh, 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 transport, and by looking, and this is effectively an index of the annual peakiness uh, of hydrographs in each hydrological year, uh, you see these basins are also becoming much peakier. That is, that they, it's not just there's more water in them, that there is more hydrological variability with bigger peak flows, particularly in the midsummer, that again will aid our ability to transport uh, sediment. Now, the question is why, why are you seeing this? And it all comes down to the interaction between temperature and snow. Now, here we have uh, on the same, uh, uh, the axis you've seen before, from the mid-70s to 2014. Um, the bars are sediment yield. I've just a little bit of standardization here by basin area. For each glacier, you can see the percentage of the snow cover that, that uh, was still on the glacier at the end of September of each year, effectively at the end of each melt season. And what you see is that during the 1980s, when we're getting sediment yield rising, the snow cover on the glacier is generally falling <coughs> at the end of September. When we have this period of low sediment yield, we have more snow uh, cover on the glacier, and then again, it declines the snow cover as we get through to the very high sediment yields that we've seen in the last few years. And it seems to be that what's going on here is the snow cover is driving all parts of the road are actually downed. The bits in green are the bits where the drainage basin goes directly into a dam. Most of the road is in yellow, which means that it's impacted by hydropower, but it's water abstraction systems. And these take the water away, but they leave the sediment behind. They maintain the sediment connectivity. This is just a lovely graph, I love this. Just showing the wonderful engineering that's been done in these systems to move water around and leave the sediment behind. 
In addition, what we see is very strong coupling of the way these systems are managed to climate change. It's not just you've got hydropower impacting sediment and climate change impacting sediment. You see a coupling between how climate change is changing the way the, the industries are managing uh, hydropower. Uh, and all of that means that when we try to, to get human impacts identified in this basin, it's a mistake to say, how does human impact compare with climate impacts, climate, driven, climate impacts driven by humans? The two are so strongly coupled, you can't separate them. I don't have time to go into that, uh, but we do have some uh, uh, ideas and data on that that confirm it. So, specific conclusions. You can see already in Lake Geneva a signature of human-induced climate change. And we think it's due to warming-induced glacier retreat and the ability of glaciers uh, under this glacier retreat to evacuate sediment from their beds. And that's observed despite the Swiss Rhone being heavily impacted by human activity that should, in theory, disconnect sediment flux. My three more general points, though, what this means, and I think this case study illustrates, that when we talk about stratigraphy, we need to think about the way in which global change interacts with local human impacts. And even when we talk about hydropower, we have to look at the specific hydropower culture that's developed in each country. In the Swiss, the wonderful Swiss system is uh, extremely different. In the Anthropocene, it means that we can both increase or decrease the rate of production stratigraphy under the same global forcing, according to what these, these human conditioning processes are. And finally, uh, there may be strong coupling between global change and local human impacts, which means it's very difficult to attribute what you're seeing to one uh, or the other. You also have to look at the way in which these systems are co-evolving. Uh, now, thank you for listening. I'd also like to thank some of the people who've been very important in supporting this research. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stuart, for a very interesting talk. Um, we have time for two or three questions before lunch. Anybody want to take the floor, Christoph? Thank you for this very interesting talk. I, I was just wondering about extreme events, yeah. right? Like uh, these big flooding events we had in 2005 and, uh, and also in the last years. Uh, what is the role of them in, in mobilizing the, right. the sediments? It's a very good question. I mean, I'm going to refer to a different, different example there. Um, what often matters uh, in these kinds of systems um, is getting the, the effective rainfall to fall on a surface that is not snow-covered. Uh, now, uh, if you can do that, uh, then you can actually start to rapidly increase the amount of sediment that you're um, uh, producing. Now, I'll give you an example from the Vallon de Nord, which is based on a tiny, tiny percentage glaciated, where there what we found is that accompanying the increase in the frequency of convective rainstorms over the last 30 years, We've also found that these rainstorms are not distributed equally within the year. They tend to occur um, from midsummer onwards. And though that's a good example of where you get extreme sensitivity to these kinds of extreme events uh, because they're occurring at the right time. If you get a bigger rainfall occurring at other times of the year, uh, it, it, it has a little bit less effect on these alpine environments because it's, it's what goes on in terms of rain and snow that matters. Of course, you can have rain on snow melt as well, but in terms of geomorphology, that's important. Now, the Valley Dunor example I gave you there is very interesting because what we've also seen, following almost exactly that trend in um, uh, 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 geomorphologically effective rainfall, is sedimentation in the valley bottom uh, related to that. So we've done the same analysis there uh, that I showed earlier, we've been looking at change detection to see that effectively we've got more sediment coming down. And that's, I think, a good example of where, in other settings, extreme events uh, can be very important, particularly in non-glacial basins. Our uh, answer in glacial basins um, is that uh, where extreme events are important is actually in the dynamics of the glacier, and particularly surcharge of the subglacial hydrological system, which effectively can float the glacier momentarily, which increases the access of water to sediment-rich uh, layers of the bed. So, so they, the, the principle is there certainly in both kinds of environments, although the actual physical processes are somewhat different. 
Just to follow up on that, you mentioned the retreating glaciers as an important factor. What about um, changes to permafrost at high altitudes? Right, um, a very good question. Um, the, the, I think that the, the slides I showed you where we used change detection uh, on the, uh, uh, the, the, the hillside effectively, that largely relates to uh, changes in permafrost. And if you look at the, the, the most uh, intensive changes, whether it's accelerations of rock glaciers, whether it's uh, acceleration in the rates of surface loss, uh, you see that those are environments where there is some kind of water content uh, within the sediment. And that's why rock glaciers accelerate, because the rate of plastic deformation increases, but also you get some basal um, of water being produced that can lubricate uh, shear layers uh, underneath the bed. So, so uh, yes, I mean, you can actually detect in the landscape this permafrost effect, and you can see which bits of the landscape, which landforms are the most sensible. What our conclusion is for the moment is that in terms of sediment flux to Lake Geneva, I don't think we're yet seeing a signal of that, and that's because of these high levels of disconnection that you get in the basin, except in the most extreme events. Final short question with a short answer. Oh, and everybody wants to go for lunch, so thank you very much again, Stuart, for a very good